This is part two, um, uh, the second and I think the last of my um, lectures accompanying uh, our work on African American vernacular English this week. Um, I was just chatting with you on Slack, uh, one of you on Slack, and you were delighted that that was Langston Hughes here. The reason that I have Langston Hughes here, um, it, uh, one of the reasons I have him is because A, he was born in Joplin, Missouri, right nearby, but also he was um, somebody who was an important uh, person in the, the the Harlem Renaissance, also known at the time as the New Negro Movement, um, which wanted to sort of make a claim that um, black culture, African-American culture, had something to contribute to, to um, uh, America wi more widely, and that it was a valuable culture in its own right, um, and that, that the advancement of black people wouldn't just come through assimilation to, to what was the white standards and the white norms um, of the, you know, the hegemonic dominant culture. And so he's, he's kind of a, um, uh, an inspirational figure uh, and a foundational figure for African-American literature in the 20th century, though there are many others. I talked about Zora Neale Hurston in the last lecture, who was part of that same Harlem Renaissance movement. Um, so, yeah, we, last time we talked about the origins um, of uh, African-American vernacular English and the two hypotheses, Creole, uh, Creolist and Anglicist. Um, and we talked about some of the, the ways that, that black English may have already been emerging in Africa um, through the, the, the development of pidgin there um, and creolization among the various peoples of West Africa. Um, today we're going to talk about development and expansion. During the first part of the um, uh, experience of, if you want to call it that, of African Americans in um, the United States, most of them lived in the South. Um, uh, because that's where they had been brought um, uh, to uh, to be forced laborers, slaves, and that's where many of them remained um, at, even after emancipation. They continued to work as uh, many worked as subsistence farmers. Although there were there were some who had moved to the cities already. For example, um, in Charleston, South Carolina, there was a black area of the city um, before the Civil War where free blacks lived alongside. African Americans who were technically slaves, but had their own quarters and sort of like lived um, uh, on their own and worked in factories because their owners um, rented them to emergent industry in the South. And so they paid part of their wages back to their owners, but kept part of their that for themselves. Weird, huh? Anyway, um, 90% of African Americans lived in, in the South, and the, and the population ranged from 20% to 90%. And they lived, and they, they were 90% um, in places like Mississippi and Alabama, where there was, and Louisiana, where there was intense cultivation of um, cotton, a highly, highly profitable uh, crop that drove the economic power that was um, the American South. Uh, before and to a certain extent after the Civil War. Um, their, their, their population grew and continued to grow, and there was in-migration uh, not just from Africa, but uh, from the Caribbean. Uh, there was um, uh, slaves, they were, they were brought over as slaves, and some people came yeah, um, to the uh, American South. Um, in after 1900, we have an, a sort of a crucial event for which shaped American society, um, and, uh, and certainly the experience of black people in the United States. And that's known as the Great Migration. And actually there was the Great Migrations and, and series of migrations. And then the, the New South, more recent New South Migration. So the, the original Great Migration begins in, during the First World War, when there is a need for um, industrial laborers, uh, uh, industrial workers, and the sort of second wave of industrialization in the United States. So more than six and a half million Southern African Americans moved to the urban North. Um, and they brought their Southern accent with them. I'm sure um, you have noticed the resemblance between American, uh, Southern American English and black English, uh, African American English. It's, and that's because they shaped each other um, in ways that I'm not sure that... Uh, and some Southerners may not have always been willing to acknowledge, but when you live in close, when 90% of the people 
um, in your area are, Af are African American and speaking African American English, it's going to have some effect on the way you speak, especially when, and think back to the Normans and the Anglo Saxons, especially when they're raising your children and cooking your meals. Um, so, and in fact, if you listen to, um, I personally, when I talk, hear a white person from Mississippi, an older person on the phone, and I used to work in a, in a call center taking orders for a ladies' catalog, so heard a lot of accents from everywhere. When you hear an old person uh, from Mississippi, um, but you don't see their face, it's hard to tell if they're, if they're black or white. Um, uh, well, it's hard for me to tell at any rate. I'm sure if you're from Mississippi, you have more subtle ear for these things. But they, um, they moved to the north and they brought their accent with them. Um, and they, and they, these periods of movement were clustered, especially during the two world wars, when the need for labor overcame discriminatory hiring practices in heavy industry. And so they went to Chicago, um, to New York, to Cleveland, to Milwaukee, to all the, all the northern industrial cities, Detroit, at, uh, which was a great industrial powerhouse. Um, in, in the, the earlier part of the 20th century. Um, and um, this, these places became, of course, um, centers for the emerging, uh, an emerging black consciousness and middle class. The first uh, <clears throat> black newspapers were um, uh, published in, in Chicago and, and, in, and, of course, in New York. Harlem became the center of this emerging high culture for, for the African-American people. Um, jazz and the blues uh, became American music and, and uh, got a wide uh, listenership and became associated with American culture, not just black American culture, because of the Great Migration, because of this great sort of exodus, this movement of African Americans all across the country to, to Houston, um, to, to Los Angeles, to Seattle, and so on. Um, now, uh, it ended, the Great Migration ended, and it ended because of the um, beginning of deindustrialization in the United States. And um, when the factories started closing down, it is, you know, a tragic part of our history that the first people to be kicked off the assembly lines were the people who were the last people allowed in. Um, That's black women and then black men. And so um, these, what had been prosperous um, or, or prospering communities uh, suddenly um, were uh, hit by um, um, an economic change uh, that, that they were the most vulnerable to. And so um, black areas became um, increasingly poor and, and, and with poverty came uh, in many places, crime, etc., and everything that, that has become stigmatized as like the ghetto and stuff like that, and, you know, South Chicago. But, um, uh, I mean, this is this too. This is a course on language, so this is really complicated. But but it's um, it's worth learning more about these things. It really is. Uh, but what one of the one of the effects of de, of de, one of the things that caused pe blacks to start moving back to the South was um, the civil rights movement and desegregation. The South became a less dangerous place for black people to live. Um, the um, de de deindustrialization in the North, as I said, but also economic development in the South. Um, this is a period when lots of people, not just black people, but white people were moving to the Sun Belt, right? To Atlanta, to Nashville, to Houston, to, to all these like, uh, this developing urban life in the South. Um, and so uh, a lot of um, black people came back. And of course, um, actually, if you're a hip hop fan, you know that um, in the last 15, 20 years, uh, the South, and particularly Atlanta, have become centers of black culture and of, of um, black music. Um, you, could, you could think of uh, people from you know the Dirty South, Childish Gambino, to uh, I don't know others. I'm not I'm not a huge expert on on hip hop by any means. Um, all right, so enough about the history of of black English. As fascinating as it is, let's talk about the language itself. Um, eight. There are eight distinctive features of African American vernacular English. And even though it's a lot to say, I think I should say it rather than black English because it's more specific. Black English could include just the way black people speak in standard English with an accent, or it could include UK, UK black English, which is its whole other thing that's in fact inflected by Caribbean features and, and so forth. Um, all right, so devoicing of voice stops and stress syllables. So instead of saying, um, 
bread, you say bread. Give me a piece of bread. And I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not going to lean into doing this too hard because it's, it's problematic. But reduction of final consonant clusters when followed by a word beginning with a vowel. Uh, instead of lift, you say lift, lift, lift up that thing. Instead of bust, you say bus. Um, uh, bussing for busting, as in I was busting my ass. Um, and sometimes you get these contractions like uh, um, finna, like you finna dit. Um, which is actually a contraction, a, a, de a reduction of final co a consonant cluster from fixinta, a southern idiom. See the connection between southern and African American English? Fixinta becomes finna. I'm finna get out of here. Um, and you all, another feature that goes on in, in AAV is inflection loss, which as we know in this class has been going on since the late Old English period. Um, so. Uh, African-American English chops off a few other uh, inflections, including um, the plural S. So um, three instead of three boys walk, walk into a store, three boy walk into a store. Um, possessive S is the absence that that's like instead of saying, you know, that's Jason's shirt, you say that that Jason's shirt. Um, this is more inflection loss, just like we've seen going on in English for a while. Um, a general absence in the third person singular verb, instead of you saying he walk, he walks, you say he walk. But now we're going to get into one of the cool things about um, Black English, about uh, African AAVE, which is um, the way that it does slightly different things with time um, and verbs, uh, in, in with, in with its verbs than standard English does. So there is a, a word, a stressed bin which marks an action or state that took place or began in a long, remote time and is still, still relevant, um, and which is an aspectual marker. Um, there's an absence of the present tense copula and auxiliary, that is, you don't say she is nice, you say she nice. Um, and there is um, one, one distinctive feature is that you, the habitual B. And you might have heard about this if you watched the John McWhorter video, but it's if you say he walk, uh, it's different than he be walking. He walk means that he is walking right now. He be walking means he is given to walking. It's something that he does on a regular basis. Um, you know, he work means he's at work. He be working means he has a job. So that's, that's aspect. Um, tense refers to when something takes place. And aspect refers to how long or how frequently it takes place. Uh, so, African American vernacular English has a rich aspectual system. Um, it has uh, all these aspects, and, and standard English has far fewer. Um, he be working Tuesdays is the habitual continuative aspect. Um, he stay working is an intensified continuative. He steady working, an intensive continuative, not habitual. I love all these terms. Um, he been working is the perfect progressive. That means he was working for a while. This is something that happened. Uh, he finna go to work means he is about to go to work, right? So there's all these are all kind of modal auxiliaries that exist in African American vernacular English, and you know the Creolists uh, um, see a lot of these aspects in Western Af in West African languages, and um, so there's the belief that there is this grammatical substratum of, of certain West African uh, language families in. Um, black English. Like I said, I don't have the expertise to say whether that's true or not, but it seems like an interesting coincidence. Um, so, one of the things that we talked about last week um, in the discussion boards, but which I think is really interesting, is why does a st stigmatized variety survive? How and why does African American vernacular English continue to influence standard American English? Um, uh, these are these are two two separate and big questions here. Um, one is why do people people speak a language that is considered by some to be substandard, um, uh, uneducated, and it has to do with culture. It has to do with belonging. It has to do do with um, being people being authentic to who they see themselves as. Um, and the other question about the relationship between African American vernacular English and standard English is a really interesting question, and one we're going to get more into in week 15. But um, um, Americans, white Americans, love to bite little bits of Black English as as a kind of way to get their language flavor. And there's there's a kind of 
uh, tension or debate over who gets to use black culture, black English, etc. Um, if you read the chapter on black English in Seth Lear, I, I gave a link to a, um, a storyteller, an, Afri an old African American guy, um, recorded in the 70s, telling the story of the signifying monkey that goes back so long. Um, uh, one of the uh, one sort of feature of African American linguistic culture is, is a game called the Dozens, which is the ritual exchange of insults, ilmanos, etc. And of course, this this is similar to the old English custom and the old Scottish custom of flighting, um, which is also a kind of ritualized exchange of insults, meant to build community and solidarity. In fact, rather than to be authentic insults, you know, I, I, I do not actually mean to imply that your mother does sit around the house. Um, let's talk briefly about some of the uh, controversies over education in um, uh, African American vernacular English. I think your best source would be to watch the PBS video here. But um, in 1996, the School Board of Oakland declared its intention to instruct African American students in their primary language. Um, Ebonics uh, is another term for African-American vernacular English coined by a um, scholar in the 1970s. And so they, just, they were going to teach them in black English and, and help, help them use that to facilitate their acquisition and mastery of English language skills. Um, and, and so they were trying to recognize that AAVE is an, another language a closely related one, but another one, and that they would be learning stand that for many people um, from, you know, African-American communities where they didn't have that much contact with standard English, uh, they would come to school learning um, set standard English as a second language. And um, part of the, the, what the board wanted to do is to seek bilingual edu um, education funding from the federal government. Um, which they had, I don't think the federal government had had teaching speakers of black English in, in mind, but that's because it generally wasn't considered to be a um, second language. It's just considered to be poor English or substandard English um, by many people. Now, the thing is, this debate wasn't just between whites and blacks. It was also a debate within the black community itself that parallels a number of other an ongoing kind of cluster of debates within the African American community over assimilation, over what's called respectability politics, etc. And of course, um, one one group uh, of people took out this rather striking ad, um, with a picture of Martin Luther King that says, "I has a dream." Does this bother you? It should. We've spent over four hundred years f fighting for the right to have a voice. Is this how we'll use it? More importantly, is this how we'll teach our children to use it? So there were pretty strong reactions at the time. Um, this is from the National Head Start Association. Uh, and, I mean, it's not my place to sort of judge these positions, but I think that maybe, you know, coming at it as a linguist, I think the people who made this ad didn't really, I don't think they fully appreciated what the... Um, the school board of Oakland was trying to do, but um, I think that... Maybe the school board of Oakland didn't appreciate the kind of optics of saying we're going to teach students in in African vernacular English. So, further questions: Why does a, a so-called basilect survive? A, a, that is a dialect that is considered lower than in another speech. And I'm not, I don't think it is lower, um, but it certainly has had that. Um, association. We certainly see that sense that this is definitely saying that black English, that African-American vernacular English is lower than standard English. So why does a basilic survive? Another question that is interesting is why is African-American vernacular English such a rich source of borrowing for standard English? I mean, if you've said the word cool, you're actually saying a word that originated in AAVE, even though it was 70 or 80 years ago. A lot of times uh, it's been part of our language so long that we forget that it was actually originating in Black English. Um, words that originally come from uh, AAVE to Standard English, cool, hip, jive, cat. Some of these are out of date. Dig, bad, get down, banging, groovy. Groovy, right? You get, nothing seems more Caucasian than like a hippie, like groovy, man. But that was something that jazz musicians said back in the 40s and the 50s. 
newer the bomb this is that's i know that's fallen out of favor my, my son makes fun of me for saying that but you know holla yolo twerk bay trap queen ratchet squad fleek yes basic shade lit i think also extra maybe all of these words are from african-american vernacular english so um there's a lot to be read about the role that black english plays in american society um i i urge you to read um these articles that i've linked here um on linguistic profiling on how people um, will call on a telephone to ask if an apartment is um for rent and when the when the when the when the person being called he hears the person speaking with a, with a black accent or in black english they um, immediately uh tell them that the apartment is not available or that the vacancy has been filled um there's there's we see similar things also in fact there's been a study of um, people looking at names on applications and if a name reads as african-american then the person is less likely to get the job so there's and a lot of these things that, you know, racism is often not systematic, like Ku Klux Klan style, like I am a white supremacist. A lot of it is reflex. A lot of it is just sort of um, like, it's like tilting the pinball machine a little bit, but these tilts have a cumulative effect. And this is not really interesting critical article on the way that white people use black English and black imagery on the internet. Um, and, and it's, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hard read, um, because it also shows you a lot of, um, really, uh, rough racist stuff that, that you find, but this is what we're dealing with in the 21st century. And this is how we have to, and we have to find a way forward. So uh, this is a great read. I, I recommend it. Um, it's by, by an, an artist of color who's, who's looked into this stuff very carefully himself. Okay. Um, so issues in the 21st century, looking toward towards next week over American culture. Um, you know what? We're going to get into this. We'll get into this later. Um, this is enough for now. Have a great day.